We've provided that and the other two in a note. Thank you very We're much. We're also in hard copy on your desks for ease. Thank you very much indeed. Um, my, 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 my lady, my lady, lady Justice Power asked yesterday, following a question as well from Lord, Lord Justice Holroyd, about whether an arrest is covered by Article 15, and I mentioned I would try and find some references to it. 5-1. Yes, the 5-1. Um, see. Um, the best, I, um, as good a summary as any in any event, would appear to be in the Essen Denmark case, and it's at page 709 of the bundle, paragraph 118. And at paragraph 118, the court asked the question whether the purpose requirement in Article 5.1c may constitute an obstacle to preventative detention under the second limb. The court will, of course, recall this was the case of the Danish football, um, well, alleged hooligans who were detained during the time of the match. Uh, at paragraph 118, the court answered, the court stated in lawless that the purpose requirement under Article 5.1c applies to all categories of cases referred to in this subparagraph. However, it should be noted that the court has recognized in other cases that this requirement is to be interpreted and applied with a certain flexibility when the intention which once existed of bringing the applicant before the competent legal authority does not materialize for some reason. The fact that an arrested person was neither charged nor brought before a judge does not necessarily mean that the purpose of his or her detention was not in accordance with Article 5.1c. Thus, in Brogan, the four applicants had been arrested and detained under prevention of terrorism legislation on suspicion of being <coughs> concerned in the commission preparation or instigation of acts of terrorism. They were released without charge after periods of between four and six days, the shortest being four days and six hours and without having been brought before a magistrate. The court held that in the case of each of the four applicants, there had been a violation of Article 5.3 on account of the failure to observe the requirement of promptness, but no violation of Article 5.1, only then 5.1c was concerned. It stated, the fact that the applicants were neither charged nor brought before a court does not necessarily mean that the purpose of their detention was not in accordance with 5.1c. As the government and the commission have stated, the existence of such a purpose must be considered independently of its achievement. And subparagraph C of Article 5.1 does not presuppose that the police should have obtained sufficient evidence to bring charges, either at the point of arrest or while the applicants were in custody. Such evidence may have been unobtainable, or in view of the nature of the suspected offences, impossible to produce in court without endangering the lives of others. There is no reason to believe that the police investigation in this case was not in good faith or that the detention of the applicants was not intended to further that investigation by way of confirming or dispelling the concrete suspicions which, as the court
court has found grounded their arrest. Had it been possible, the police would have fully assumed to have raised charges and the applicants would have been brought before a competent legal authority. And then the court went on at 119, again applying the first limit of 51C. The court reached similar findings in Erdogan and Turkey and Petkov and Tokyo and Bulgaria. And at 120, the court discerned no reason why it should not also apply such flexibility to preventative detention under the second alternative of 51C. On the contrary, there are a number of arguments for doing so. If it is understood that in order to fulfill the purpose requirement, a subjective intention ought to be present from the beginning of the detention, that would have the undesirable <coughs> consequence of excluding any short, sort of short-term preventative detention as described in Ostendorf, or was the situation in the present case, where the purpose was not to bring the detainees before a judge, but rather to release them after a short period, as soon as the risk had passed. <coughs> and just, um, and we're on that passage in response to my learned friend, Mr. Hermer's submissions, that the judge adopted an overly expansive meaning to the words effected for the purpose of bringing him before a competent authority. The Strasbourg jurisprudence, as we've just seen, does demonstrate a flexible, consequence-driven interpretation on preventative detention, which is the second limb of Article 5.1, where no offence has been committed at all. So why not, we ask rhetorically, on the first part of Article 5.1c, which de deals with detention following arrest? If a flexible interpretation in relation to of, for the purpose of bringing him before a court, is permitted where there is in fact no intention to bring him before a court at all, why should the detention in this case not be regarded as having been effected for the purpose of bringing him before a competent legal authority, when, as the judge said at paragraph 44 of his judgment, that was the clear end point of the detention. And if I could just turn briefly to paragraph 44, it's not a paragraph I looked at yesterday. Uh, paragraph 44 is at page 70. Seventy-two. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, I have to confess it's fallen out of my bundle, so I'm going to have to find it. I'm going to have to find it. <laughs> But it, it, it gives you a free hand, if nothing else, Mr. Warner. <laughs> but perhaps the easiest thing is to invite you to read it. Um, it says, it, it draws a distinction, you know, so it should be easier under the first limb, satisfy the purpose requirement, than under the second limb. Exactly. And he then, um, we say the judge was right to say that this is, in fact, our case. Is a, is a more straightforward case than Hicks, Essen, Denmark, or Ostendorf. Because um, in this case, we have the clear end point that the person is going to court, unlike in Essen, Denmark, where there was never any intention to go to court at all. And that leads in the, that led the judge then into paragraph 45 that we looked at yesterday, where he said, of course, it does not follow that pre-trial detention will necessarily be compatible with Article 5. And that's because in addition to the purpose requirement, i.e. the need to bring them before a court, and the need for continuing reasonable suspicion that the detainee has committed an offence, there are requirements imposed by the express words of Article 5.3 and by the case law interpreting it. And that's where we get into the material insufficient reasons. So 
Can I just get my uh, going back on your suggestion? Have I understood them correctly? Um, that you say that the initial detention was upon arrest. Yes. We haven't looked at all of the recorded reasons for detention at that time, which you may want to take up for the address at page one two two. One two two. Thank you. Um, uh, you say that's the initial detention, and that all that was happening. Uh, in the evening was a decision to continue detention. Yes. So the stated reasons for detention, and under what section of case was this detention? Um, can I attest to my knowledge of case? I assume he was arrested on the grounds it was necessary under section 24 of right, case. I think it's section, if you look at the reasons for detention, I think it's section 37.3, which is where you post-arrest can keep somebody yes. in yes. to secure, obtain evidence by questioning to secure or preserve evidence. Yes. So how do you say that is compatible with Article 513? If that's the initial detention, that's the case that you're... Well, the initial detention will be the arrest when he's arrested on suspicion of the offence of the, well, um, and the arrest conditions under, I think it's one of the cases that's under Section 24, some of the arrest right. conditions. But that's the initial okay. detention. That's the initial detention. And what are the reasons for that detention? Um, because he's suspected of having committed a criminal offence. And I, I, I do remind the court, there is no dispute in this case that the initial arrest and indeed his detention up until this point where the custody officer decides not to release him, there's no dispute any longer in this case that any of that was unlawful or not Article 5 compliant. Have you, have you looked at these two pages in any detail? Well, I'm just, just, just now, I confess, because of the fact that there's no complaint about the earlier part of the detention. Um, but, but it is right that when he would be brought to the police station, the custody sergeant would have to review the, the, the grounds for arrest and um, confirm that there was a reason, which one of the reasons, I think it's under Section 24, for an arrest is to obtain evidence by questioning. So um, is your analysis that even that um, even when this record was made at page one two two seven twenty one, yes. that was uh, again already an Article <coughs> Five three situation because yes. he wasn't being detained. Yes, because he's been deprived of his liberty. So the first detention on your analysis is is when we we, we know he arrives at the police station. Well, I can't remember seven. where on the facts he was arrested, but as soon as one is arrested, one has. He was arrested at home. He was arrested at home, so that's effectively when he was detained. And I wouldn't myself call it the first detention because he remained in detention from that point. <coughs> so that's the initial detention when he's yes. taken in, into custody yes. at home yeah. and brought to the police station. Yes, because at that point um, he is um, no longer free to move where he wants to move. He's under arrest. He has lost his liberty, he's been deprived of his liberty within Article 5.1. Um, but that's a perfectly lawful deprivation of liberty because, as the European Court of Human Rights have recognised, the police are entitled to arrest people and indeed um, question them when they have arrested them and carry out other matters such as relevant um, searches, if that applies. It would be pretty odd if. if a situation if they were not. No, yes, it would, it would might throw the system might into some... To a halt. <laughs> yes, um, certainly so something, quite some chaos would follow. Um, but, um, <clears throat> so he is in detention from that time. And of course, PACE contains many safeguards in relation to that detention. And my lady, um, Lady Justice Carr, is, I think, rightly picking up on the fact that the custody record will record <coughs> on a number of occasions to it that that the reasons for that ongoing detention have been vouchsafed. And before a decision is taken to charge, um, there will be a period where the reason for that detention in any case is to preserve evidence or to obtain evidence by questioning. Um, in this case, there was an interview, although the appellant gave um, a no-comment interview. Um, and in some cases, at the same time as that is happening, um, the, the, there will be searches of premises. I don't think that was um, the case in relation to this particular uh, situation. 
Um, but there are always, uh, um, our system, and particularly PACE, has built into it um, considerable numbers of reviews of detention before the, the individual even gets before a court. Yes. So does, does that answer my lady's question? Um, and to summarise, therefore, what my submissions are, my lady is right. Uh, my submissions drawn <coughs> together in relation to Article 5 and Article 38.1 are, in essence, these. Firstly, a lawful arrest and detention on suspicion of committing an offence falls within Article 5.1c and meets the requirement of being for the purpose of bringing the offender before a judicial authority, um, S and Denmark. A fortiori, a case where the arrested person is then charged and given a hearing date before the said judicial authority. Secondly, there comes a point, indeed in our domestic system, there come many points when the, 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 the detention must be reviewed and when the suspicion of an offence is not enough to maintain that detention pending trial. Domestically, one of the occasions on which that point is reached, and it's the occasion which is the subject of this case, is when is that under section 38.1, where when the custody officer must review and can only continue the detention if one or more of the reasons set out in section 38.1 or section 38.2 in relation to a juvenile are met. <coughs> Thirdly, those reasons set out in section 38.1 and applied to juveniles by section 38.2 are in accordance with the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights as reviewed and summarized by the Grand Chamber, no less, in Bujadi. Article 5.3 and the jurisprudence under it supply those reasons which will be regarded as material and sufficient in addition to the continuing intention to bring the suspect before the court. And it is of note that in both IA in France and Bujadi, the court had no difficulty with the proposition that the detentions fell within 5.1c. Fourthly, in IA in France, the Strasbourg Court held that own protection was a sufficient reason to justify detention. In Bujadi, the Grand Chamber endorsed that. So, whilst the jurisprudence on own protection is limited in the sense that the principle was only of direct application in IA and France, and it failed on its facts in that particular case, the jurisprudence is nonetheless sufficient. And if our courts held differently, 
we would be going in the opposite direction to the case law which exists on this issue. And fifthly, um, for all of those reasons and the reasons I sought to demonstrate through his judgment yesterday, uh, the judge's analysis at paragraphs 43 to 47 of his judgment is, I respectfully submit, faultless. <coughs> and in accordance with the um, jurisprudence under Article 5. Given the way that you put your case um, in relation to initial detention and continuing detention, do you disagree with the judge's conclusion at paragraph 49 that the only protection reason is in principle capable of justifying detention under Article 51C? Ignore Article 53. No, I don't disagree with him, because um, what he is saying is that the, the purpose of the detention is to bring the juvenile before court within 51C, and the reasons, 51C, as, as, as Bujadi said, and as the judge said at paragraph 47, has to be read with 5.3, and 5.3 imports the reasoning of 5.3 is imported into 5.1c um, when looking at whether the, there are 5 plus cc plus grounds. I, 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 don't, I, I, it's, I, I don't disagree with what he said because he's saying, um, he's reading them both, both together. Exactly, so, so take them separately. Just, just take them separately for a moment. Would you... Um, disagree with the proposition that own protection is a valid reason for initial detention under 5.1c? Yes, but you couldn't go and arrest someone for their own protection or take them into custody for their own protection. I think that must be right. The, 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 um, the I'm, so the, I'm not sure I read the judge as saying that. And that's not what the judge was saying. No. Because he's talking about continued detention. Exactly. That's the whole point, isn't it? Yes. Part of the paragraph. Yes. And what he says there has to be read in the light of the preceding paragraphs. Yes. It's, it, it, that, that's absolutely right. It's the fact he refers to the continued detention. And, and that, as I say, fits the structure. <coughs> of, um, it, it, it fits in with his analysis. Yes. Uh, there are certain circumstances, of course, under the protection when people can be. Um, into the state for their own protection, child protection, for instance, the obvious example. Or under the Mental Health, health Act. Mental Health Act. Um, but here, specifically um, in 5.1c, the, the sine qua non, as the court puts it, is that there is a suspicion of an offence having been committed. So that's, that's the starting point, and that's why it's in 5.1c. Because you... you it's not a case of saying you can have own protection on its own. It has to exist along with the sine qua non, which is the ongoing suspicion that the person has committed an offence, and you're going to bring them before a judicial authority for that. And can I just be clear, because um, uh, my, my friends handed me a case this morning, I'm not saying that the custody sergeant is a judicial officer. <laughs> Far from it. And the judicial officer is the, is the officer in front of the, the youth court the next morning. Um, but our domestic scheme in having that review by the custody sergeant, even before you get in front of the judicial officer, um, is um, clearly Article 5 compliant. It's much better than waiting until you just get before the judicial officer. Um, 
Does it make a difference to the compatibility of Section 38 of the detained person as a child? As a preliminary point, we submit it would seem perverse if the police can refuse bail to an adult for their own protection, but do not have a similar power to protect a juvenile. And secondly, we submit there is certainly nothing in the terms of the Convention itself to suggest that the protection of juveniles is not permitted under Article 5. Uh, on the contrary, as uh, the intervener pointed out yesterday, 1D expressly envisages the detention of children. Um, but that is an additional provision to 151C, and indeed in the materials from the intervener, the guide to Article 5, at page 956 of the bundle. The heading, I should say, is at page 955, where the... Sorry, it's 955, my, my mistake which is dealing with minors. With which tab was it? Um, uh, 34. 34, thank you. And it, the, the, the guide says the notion of a minor encompasses persons under the age of 18. In the light of European standards and resolution of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Um, paragraph 100, subparagraph D is not only a provision to permit the detention of a minor, it contains um, specific but not exhaustive examples of when minors might be, in which minors might be detained, A, for their educational provision, B, for the purposes of bringing them before a competent legal authority. And then, uh, one oh eight on page nine five six. The, the guide says the second limb of Article 5.1d governs the lawful detention of a minor for the purpose of bringing him or her before the competent legal authority. According to the Travaux Preparatoire, this provision was intended to cover detention of a minor prior to civil or administrative proceedings, while the detention in connection with criminal proceedings was intended to be covered by 5.1c. However, the detention of a minor accused of a crime during the preparation of a psychiatric report necessary to Um, the point I'm trying to make is it's not a case of uh, you have to, minors have to be under 5.1c. 5.1c is the applicable provision where someone is arrested. <coughs> As to point, my third point in relation to this is that there is no dispute that the convention must be interpreted in accordance with relevant international treaty obligations. And indeed, the judge at paragraph 50, sorry, paragraph, yes, paragraph 50 of his judgment, pages 73 to 74, had specific regard to those principles. Uh, that's where he sets out the principles that the protection will be permissible only for a short period, for a time at least. The precise time will depend on all the circumstances, but the longer the detention, the longer the gap between the original offence and release, and therefore the less likely the circumstances surrounding the offence will generate the risk of reprisal or other danger. Furthermore, when the detainee is a child, international law requires that detention be used as a measure of last resort and for the shortest appropriate period of time. See Article 37B of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, ref 
enacting Article 13.1 of the United Nations Standard Minimum Rules for the Administration of Juvenile Justice. And it's well established that the European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, be interpreted where possible in accordance with the CRC. Um, of course, one of the matters which anybody exercising functions in relation to children must have in mind is their, um, <coughs> the, the, their protection from harm. We made a mistake in our supplemental skeleton at um, mistaken reference. It's page um, 848B of the bundle, paragraph 1.3, where we've referred to 43B of the UN, UNHRC. I think that should attach the, to Article 3.2. And um, then also Rule 10.3 of the Beijing Rules. Um, my learned friend for the intervener took you to them yesterday, but they are at um, page 731. The reference to 43B should be a reference to Article 3.2. And 10.3 of the Beijing rules is that contacts in between, between law enforcement agencies and the juvenile offender shall be managed in such a way as to respect the legal status of the juvenile, promote the well-being of the juvenile, and avoid harm to her or him with due regard to the circumstances supporting the case. <coughs> My sixth point on this is that domestic legislation gives effect to our international obligations because Section 11 of the Children Act 2004 requires that the police discharge their functions having regard to the need to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. And there, this has been actually considered in the Section 38 context referring to the Castle case, um, which my lady, um, the President, had in mind yesterday. And it's at Page, um, the case of R. Um, B. G. against the Chief Constable of West Midlands and Birmingham City Council in 2014, decision of the Administrative Court. And it's at tab 10, page 215. <coughs> and this was a case where the facts were that the applicant or the claimant to the juvenile had been arrested following an instance where he'd stolen a car and there'd been a short police pursuit and he'd been arrested and brought back to the police station. There were in fact four different periods of detention in issue. Um, but the issue was whether his arrest and his detention, first of all, under Section 38, one was justified, and secondly, after he had the decision to detain, whether the, there was a breach of duty by either the police or the local authority in not securing his transfer to local authority. And if I could take you to paragraphs 32 to 35, you get a flavor of what the case was about. 32 to 35 are on um, page uh, 223. And 
towards the bottom you'll see the claimant's case. And it's highlighted that after an individual is charged with an offence, there is a presumption that he will be released from police detention unless one or more of the specified grounds for detention are met. For someone under 17 years of age who has been detained, if continued police detention under Section 38.1 is justified, the custody officer is obliged to move him to local authority accommodation unless this is impractical, or if the juvenile has reached the age of 12, no secure accommodation is available, and keeping him in all the local authority accommodation would be inadequate to protect the public from serious harm. In paragraph 33, it is emphasised that the first critical question is whether the conditions for continued detention are met, and that this needs to be answered prior to any consideration of moving the child to local authority accommodation. Section 38.1b requires that the juvenile is released unless one of the seven requirements of Section 38.1a is satisfied, or the juvenile is charged with murder, Section 38.1c, or the custody officer has reasonable cause to believe that the child should be detained in his own interest. In this case, the relevant considerations were those contained in 38.1a, namely the custody officer's reasonable grounds for believing the detention of the person arrested is necessary to prevent him from committing an offence, and it is argued that in deciding whether to detain the claimant, the police were obliged to have regard to the need to safeguard and promote his welfare, Section 11 of the Children Act, and to ensure that additional considerations were given to his welfare and interests to be directed to police guidance. And then at paragraph 46, which is on page 228, you see that this case, our case, is focused simply on the detention under Section 38.1a decision, but in this case, actually, there were a whole host of things in issue. The principal arguments advanced by the claimant are that the detention in police custody was contrary to Section 38.1. Second, it is alleged that the detention breached the welfare obligations obliged to him under Section 11 of the Children Act. Third, it is argued that the defendants failed to ensure his best interests were treated with the primary consideration as required by Article 3 of the UNCR. Fourth, it is contended in the written grounds that he was impermissibly held in a mixed cell block contrary to Section 31. Fifth, it is submitted that the police failed to provide a certificate as required by Section 38.7. And his Lordship, Lord Justice Cole, can certainly analyse all of those. And in relation to his analysis with particular regard to Section 11, can I draw your attention to paragraph 50? Where he sets out that no secure accommodation was available to the police following their inquiry with the local authority, and it is set out above that a credible decision was made that it was necessary to detain the claimant in police custody to avoid further offences and protect the public. The fact that the police were investigating whether secure local authority accommodation was available shortly after he was charged provides strong evidence that the police were discharging their obligation as a primary consideration to safeguard the public's welfare. In my judgment, there is no arguable basis for suggesting that the police failed to fulfil their responsibilities under Section 11 when discharging their statutory functions under Pace 1984. Section 11 has not redefined the duties of public functions in the castle and the commission of peace in the metropolis, which the interveners have helped me provide a copy of. At paragraph 51, and it provides no warrant for rewriting other statutory provisions, e.g. the Housing Act, whose rights under the London Borough of Hounslow. In the passage of his judgment in castle that is particularly relevant to this particular case, Lord Justice Pitchford observed, it was a strongly expressed hope in the view of the Supreme Court in the NZH that the purpose of Section 11 was to incorporate within domestic law the spirit of the United Kingdom's international obligations towards children stated in Article 3.1 of the UNCRC. The Court was explicit in its statements that the statutory duty was to ensure that the public functions were performed having regard to the needs of children and promote the welfare of children. The Chief Officer's statutory obligation is not confined to training and dissemination of information. It is to ensure that decisions affecting children have regard to the need to safeguard them and to promote their welfare. 
This does not mean that the duties and functions of the police are being defined by Section 11. Chapter 2.4 of the statutory guidance says the chief must also have the guard to make some explicit. In our view, the guidance accurately states the obligation of chief officers of police to carry out their existing functions in a way that takes into account the need to safeguard and promote the welfare of the children. The impact which the duty will have upon the performance of the function will depend to a significant degree upon the function being performed and the circumstances in which it is being performed. The responsibility will take on its sharpest focus when a police officer encounters a child who needs protection, for example, in circumstances such as those anticipated by the statutory guidance concerning police investigations during which a non-protected child or a child at risk comes to their attention. A police officer will not be deterred from performing his public duty to detect or prevent crime just because a child is affected, but when he does perform that duty, he must, as the circumstances require, have regard to the practical need. That paragraph 51. For the fundamental obligation to safeguard and promote the welfare of children contained in Section 11 is a critical responsibility that is imposed on certain public bodies, including the police and local authorities. It incorporates within our domestic law the essence of the United Kingdom's international obligations towards children. In these circumstances, which we have set out in Article 3 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, Section 11 makes the best interest of the child a primary consideration, given the police must ensure that their functions are discharged, having regard to the need to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. Whether there has been an actionable breach of that obligation will always depend on the facts of the case and the consideration. In my view, focusing on the circumstances relating to the first period of detention that we have set out above, it's inarguable that a breach of this kind. It's on a slightly different point, but since we're in the judgment, I'll take it. It's the point about the fact that there's no certificate, an issue that wasn't investigated below, and I can't say whether there was one or wasn't. It's not mentioned in the custody record, but equally the whole point of the certificate is that it's supposed to be filed at the youth court the next day, and the youth court file was lost. As I say, it's not a matter, because it didn't form the subject of any allegation, which was investigated. But at paragraph 52, his lordship said this, as to the submission regarding the certificate, section 38, 6, and 7 require the custody officer to provide a certificate setting out the relevant circumstances in respect of a juvenile who has been detained, rather than to give detailed reasons. Instead, the duty to provide reasons is to be found in section 38, 3, which requires the custody officer to make a written record of the grounds for detention. Although sadly, LJ, in the Queen and the Higher Education Funding Council page, indicated that there is a duty to provide reasons where the subject matter is an interest so highly regarded by the law, for example, personal liberty. For this first period of detention, the custody officer had set out brief reasons for his decisions within the body of the custody record. In my view, that step sufficiently discharged this obligation. The extent of the explanation that must be provided in the custody record will depend on the overall circumstances. And in this case, the justification for DG's detention was self-evident, bearing in mind his antecedents and the circumstances in which he was involved in a crash with a stolen motor car. Moreover, any failure to produce a certificate would not, if so facto, render the claimant's detention unlawful. It is not sustainable to argue that this court would issue a declaration in these particular circumstances, and it is of note in this regard that a bail application was made during the hearing that immediately followed this period of detention, which the court refused. Therefore, the decision of the custody sergeant was consistent with that of the relevant court. And of course, that chimes in fact with the facts of this case. The next issue I address in relation to this point, and I've gotten to my seventh or eighth point, does the existence of Section 38.6 undermine the compulsion of the custody sergeant to 
incompatibility of Section 38.1. What we submit plainly not. Firstly, Section 38.1 deals with what happens to a child who has been refused bail under Section 38.1. Secondly, in having that function, it complements rather than undermines Section 38.1. It provides for um, protections to a child who has been denied bail. Where practicable, they will spend their detention in accommodation provided by a local authority. In circumstances where a child poses a risk to others and secure accommodation is not available, they may be detained in the police station even if it would otherwise be practicable to move them. The third point I make in relation to this is that the fact that a child who poses a risk only to himself must be transferred by the police to a local authority after a refusal of bail does not mean that the power of detention for own protection cannot ever be necessary. I give following reasons for that. Firstly, it is important to note that where a child is transferred to the local authority, they are still being detained. That they're being detained, that gives rise to the corresponding duty on the local authority to accept them. And in relation to the fact they're being detained, if you could just look briefly at the wording of Section 38.6 itself, it's at tab um, 2, page 5. Well, in fact, subsection 6 um, is on page 6. And it starts with where a custody officer authorises an arrest juvenile to be kept in police detention. So there's the starting point. The child is, has been detained under section 38.1. And then the duties to transfer him to a local authority accommodation subject to exception arise. Subsection 6B, sorry, 38.6B on page 7 says that when an arrested juvenile is moved to local authority accommodation under subsection 6 above, it shall be lawful for any person acting on behalf of the local authority to detain him. So that is a significant difference from an arrangement where parents and a local authority agree a voluntary accommodation of their child under Section 20 of the Children Act, because any accommodation under the Children Act, apart from um, accommodation provided under an application under Section 25, does not carry with it the rights of the local authority to detain the person. So if he'd just been voluntarily, um, supposing there'd been some arrangement between him and his parents, that he'd voluntarily go and spend the night with foster parents, those foster parents would have had absolutely no power to detain him had he decided, in fact, he wanted to go out. But they would, if he's been detained, <laughs> under section 38.1. <coughs> uh, the third point I make in relation to this is 
that the divisional court, albeit some years ago and under um, an earlier, but in this sense, um, materially similar um, iteration of Section 38.6, has considered the point for whether a child who is transferred to a local authority remains in detention. And it's the case of the Queen against Cambridgeshire um, ex party. We shall have five, page 35. And this was a case where um, a juvenile had been brought into the, uh, arrested for the theft again of motor vehicles, and the custody officer had decided that he needed to be detained pending his appearance in court. And the custody officer contacted the local authority and asked what accommodation they had available. They only had non secure accommodation. And he considered that that didn't meet the requirements that, the, that need, were needed for the detention. And he refused it. And the court held that he had acted lawfully in doing so. The, the, the wording of Section 38.6, because it is an earlier incarnation of it, can be seen at page 38 of the bundle. And you'll see at page 38, letter F, section 38 is set out, section 38.1, where a person was, is, I think, essentially exactly the same. That provision is exactly the same grounds as, as we have now. But subsection 6, at the very bottom of page 38, at letter H, where a custody officer authorises an arrested juvenile to be kept in detention under subsection 1 above, the custody officer shall unless he certifies that it's impractical to do so, make arrangements for the arrested um, juvenile to be taken into the care of a local authority and detained by the authority. And it should be lawful to detain him in pursuance of the arrangements and then subsection 7, a certificate um, shall be made and issued to the court. And the, um, the point I rely on, on because I accept section 38.6 has been amended since but this point is met holds good looking at that subsection. At page 41, and at letter E, um, I think it was Lord, I've just forgotten, was it Lord Justice Goldford? I'll have to come back. Watkins. Well, just Watkins. Just Watkins sitting with Lord Justice, uh, Lord Judge. I, I think he was still Mr. Justice Judge at that point. <coughs> um, in our judgment, this argument is wholly undermined by the express wording of Section 38.6. If the effect of the subsection contended for is what Parliament intended, the section could, without any difficulty, have been worded to make it plain that the circumstances of detention were left entirely to the local authority. The omissions of the words are detained or omission of the amendment of the words to be kept in police detention might be sufficient. Paragraph 53, to, and I think it's not yet enforced, purports to provide an amendment of the duty of a custody officer to secure that the arrested juvenile is moved to local authority accommodation. Nevertheless, even in that amendment, the phrase to be kept in police detention will still be there. This assists, we think, to show that the essential impact of Section 38 in the case of both adults and juveniles is on the critical decision whether the arrested person is to be kept in police detention. Once that decision has been made, the custody officer becomes responsible for all necessary administrative requirements. One of them is that unless impracticable arrangements for a juvenile to be accommodated at and outside a police station should be made. The fact that detention is envisaged is also demonstrated by section 46.1 which provides for the juvenile to be brought before a magistrate's court for detention by a local authority. And we have section 46.1, I think, in the bundle. Page 9 in the bundle. Um, and it's um, 
detention after charge of beheading, and where a person is charged with an offence and after being charged is kept in police detention or is detained by a local authority. So the critical issue is that it is still a detention. The, the second response to the intervener's um, argument that um, section, the fact that child must be transferred to a local authority does not mean that the power of means that the power of detention can't ever be necessary, that's their submission, is that in any event, the power would remain necessary in every case until the alternative arrangements with the local authority could be made. Otherwise, the custody officer would simply be obliged to release the child at the point of charge. Thirdly, the power is necessary in cases where transfer is impracticable under section 38.6a. And fourthly, the power is necessary in cases where the claimant poses a risk, not just to themselves, but to others, and secure accommodation is not available. Section 38.6b. So we respectfully submit there is nothing in the existence of section 38.6 which undermines section 38.1 or 2 or renders them in any way incompatible with article 5. The next issue, and I'm coming near the end, the next issue in relation to the interveners raised is section 25 of the Children Act, which is the provision where local authorities can, um, under very stringent criteria, seek uh, to place children in um, secure accommodation. Uh, it is important to note that's an entirely separate route and it applies even where children or the child in question is not suspected of any criminal offence. For that reason, it has indeed been described as a very draconian power because uh, often it has been sought to be used uh, where a child themselves is not in any part of the criminal justice system. But for instance, if, uh, um, an example which comes up a lot uh, these days are, is cases where uh, children are at risk of sexual exploitation and can't be controlled or looked after in a way that protects them from those who would abuse them other than by getting them into a secure placement. So Section 25 provides its own regime of protection, but that in no way um, undermines the fact that a child detained under Section 38.1 is subject to all the protections of that section and indeed of PACE generally. PACE is full of protections for detainees, including, most importantly, the prompt reduction of a detained person before a court. Beijing rules provide um, um, that I can't remember the exact wording, but they do say it's best if um, it's done before as early as possible. Yes, yes they do. And in fact, in the facts of this case, which uh, is which is consistent, and it, and I think they talk about the authorized person. I can't remember the exact description of the person, but it doesn't have to be before judicial authority. Um, can I get back to you on that? Let me have a look. 
Page 730 to 731 in divider 25. I have to say, I'm struggling to get used to using electronic bundles. Even, after, even a year into the pandemic. I'm sorry, page 713, my lord. 730, yes. Bottom of 730, top of 731. Yes, the judge or a local competent official or body shall, without delay, consider the issue of release. Well, of course, we would say that was met here by the custody officer considering the issue of release. Um, but in anyway. addition to that, he was in fact brought before a judge. He was charged at 7.53 in the evening and he was before a judge by 9.30 the next morning. My learned friend, Miss Gallagher, then raised the question about whether, or, or suggested that Section 38.1 um, failed the test of arbitrariness. Um, on my own part, I can't see how the section itself could be said to be in any way arbitrary. It may, of course, be the case on particular facts that the power might be exercised arbitrarily, in which case um, a, a breach would no doubt be found. And in relation to arbitrariness, it is perhaps worth just a short excursion into the Austin case at tab 8, Austin and um, my client, the Commissioner of the Police of the Metropolis. Um, tab 8, page, uh, if we could go to page 131, please. And it's the speech of Lord Hope. You will recall this was the case about Kathleen and whether or not the um, containment measures um, of Kathleen, depending on one's taste, um, were it, it breached Article 5 that came with, within it. Um, but the question of arbitrariness was considered at paragraph 33, my Lord Hope, that's at the bottom of page 131 of the bundle. And he said, in Sadi and the United Kingdom, the Grand Chamber examined the notion of arbitrary in the context of the first limb of Article 5.1f, which authorises the detention of a person to prevent his affecting an authorised entry to the country. Its provisions were directed to the restrictions permitted by the various subparagraphs of Article 5.1. In paragraph 67, the Grand Chamber said that it is a fundamental principle that no detention that is arbitrary can be compatible with Article 5.1, and that the notion of arbitrariness extends beyond lack of conformity with national law. In paragraph 68, it said that the notion of arbitrariness in the context of this article varies to a certain extent depending on the type of detention involved. In paragraph 74, it said that to avoid being branded as arbitrary, such detention must be carried out in good faith, and its length should not exceed that reasonably required for the purpose pursued. The ambit of Article 5.1 was not the point of issue in that case, but it must follow from these observations that measures of crowd control, which involve a restriction on liberty, if they are not to be held to held to, must be carried out in good faith and should not exceed the length that is reasonably required for the purpose for which the measure was undertaken. And I should just, of course, interject here to say that it is not even suggested in this case that the custody sergeant acted otherwise than in good faith. So you say that that's the definition of the right word of arbitrariness in relation to preventive detention which is applied to detention. Yes. Um, it's the under it's an underlying principle of, of Article 5. Uh, paragraph 34 in pa is also worth noting actually because it also ties in with my earlier submissions in relation to um, how the convention is to be interpreted. Paragraph 34, his lordship went on, I would hold therefore that there is room, even in the case of fundamental rights, as to whose application no restriction or limitation is permitted by the convention, for a pragmatic approach to be taken, which takes full account of all the circumstances. No reference is made in Article 5 
to the interests of public safety or the protection of public order as one of the cases in which a person may be deprived of his liberty. This is in sharp contrast to Article 10.2, which expressly qualifies the right to freedom of expression in these respects. But the importance that must be attached in the context of Article 5 to measures taken in the interests of public safety is indicated by Article 2 of the <coughs> Convention, as the lives of persons affected by mob violence may be at risk if measures of crowd control cannot be adopted by the police. This is a situation where a search for a fair balance is necessary if these competing fundamental rights are to be reconciled with each other. The ambit that is given to Article 5 as to measures of crowd control must, of course, take account of the rights of the individual as well as the interests of the community. So any steps that are taken must be resorted to in good faith and must be proportionate to the situation to make the measures necessary. This is essential to preserve the fundamental principle that anything that is done which affects a person's right to liberty must not be arbitrary. If these requirements are met, however, it will be proper to conclude that measures of crowd control that are undertaken in the interests of the community will not infringe Article 5 rights of individual members of the crowd. The, the final point I'll respond to in relation to my learned friend, Ms. Gallagher's submissions, is she suggested that there was perhaps something about Article 38, 1, 38, 2, which lacked legal certainty. I, I confess I don't see it. Uh, the, the provision is in a published Act of Parliament. Um, we are a million miles, with all respect to my learned friend, from the facts of the Med, um, Bediev in France case, which concerned an unforeseeable diplomatic note which two governments, France and Cambodia, had um, reached with each other or made with each other, unforeseeable because it was not widely published. Uh, we're in a completely um, different territory here. And so I do submit to round up these submissions in relation to does it make a difference that the applicant was <coughs> under the age of 18, he was a child, juvenile, however one wants to um, call him. Um, does that render the provision incompatible? In our respectful submission, resoundingly not. This is a well thought out legislative scheme which takes fully account of the interests of children and our international obligations. And that leads me to turn, and I'll be very brief on this um, ground, um, to the ground three, the appeal on the facts. And um, as I understand it, the appeal relates not to the length of the period, um, but to exceptionality and whether um, the availability of other means is um, beyond attention. If I could return to the judgment at paragraph 51. The judge um, certainly set out the correct tests which she had to imply, apply in relation to these. Paragraph 51, he says, own, it's page 74, own protection to detention will be justifiable only in exceptional circumstances having to do with the nature of the offences concerned, the conditions in which they were committed and the context in which they took place. It would be wrong to be too prescriptive about what kinds of case might satisfy this condition, but it is plain that a generic concern for the children's safety will not be <coughs> The concern must arise from the nature, circumstances, and context of the offences which the detainee is suspected of having committed. As to nature, this will mean that the, the offences are ones which involve an inherent danger to the person um, committing them or of a kind capable of attracting as to circumstances and context, own protection detention will focus, require a focus on the particular factual circumstances in which those offences were committed and the characteristics of the detainee.
detainee. Relevant factors are likely to include the age and maturity of the, the detainee, and in a case where there is a danger of reprisals, the characteristics of those for whom the detainee requires protection. It will also be necessary to consider whether any of them or themselves in custody are likely to be in such custody. And then in relation to the third limitation, who's not allowed to state the correct test is paragraph 52. Um, a third important limitation flows not from the terms of IA, but from the general principle that consideration should be given to alternatives to detention, as in Denmark. Detention for detainees own protection will be necessary only if there are no reasonably available means other than detention to accord protection. This is more likely to be so if detention is authorised for a short period. The longer the period of detention, the more time is available to the police to arrange and implement protective measures short of detaining the person at risk. And then if I could turn to the judge's findings of fact at paragraph 55. He said the first reason given in the custody record that it was necessary to further detain the person for their own protection. This is consistent with the commissioner's previous case that the primary reason for the detention was the claimant's own protection. Sergeant Smith went on to record that the claimant had been involved in a gang fight in which he had sustained injuries requiring hospital treatment and that repercussions were feared, namely that the claimant may sustain further injuries or inflict violence upon his intended victims. Sergeant Smith's entry in the custody record is not to be read like a statute. And I might also add, in the light of some of the submissions that have been made, it's also not to be read as if it was a detailed judgment given in the administrative court. Um, he, this included the fact that one, the claimant was 15 years old. Two, the gang fight referred to in the custody record had taken place five days previously in Woolwich. So the judge had that fact, which my learned friend refers to, well and truly in mind. Three, that this was in a part of South East London, close to Plumstead Police Station, where the claimant was being held, and close to his home address in Charlton, where he had been arrested. Four, the claimant had identified his assailants as members of a local gang, the Deptford Boys. Five, uh, uh, and I, uh, um, this is important as well, the claimant had just been charged with violent disorder and possession of a bladed article arising out of the fight. Six, it was now about 8 p.m. the winter's evening, and seven, the claimant was to be brought to court on the following morning. And then at paragraph 57, he said, I just first conclusion that the detention was for a short period, about 13 hours overnight, for the claimant to be brought to court. Secondly, in paragraph 58, although the reasons given in the custody record are concise, they were sufficient, given the short period of detention being authorised, to demonstrate that Sergeant Smith had based his assessment of the need to protect the claimant on a consideration of the specific circumstances and context of the offence, and not merely on generic considerations. The offences with which the, children, the claimant was charged had taken place recently in the context of gang violence, close to the police station and to his home. These considerations, all of which are contained in the papers before Sergeant Smith, were sufficient to give rise to a real risk that the claimant might be attacked if he were released. The fact that he had recently suffered injuries caused by stabbing and requiring hospital treatment provided the basis for thinking that if attacked, there was a real risk he might suffer injury or death. These are, in my view, exceptional circumstances having to do with the nature of the offences concerned, the conditions in which they were committed, and the context in which they took place as required by the Stanford Court and IA. And although this fact was not known to Sergeant Smith at the time, it was not without significant that when the, significance that when the claimant was bailed by the Crown Court some five weeks later, it was subject to a condition that he resides in his aunt's in North London. It's also noteworthy that some months after that, on the 5th of July 2012, the claimant's solicitors wrote to, to an officer at Plumstead Station, pointing out that the claimant was at risk of attack, given his involvement in the police. The claimant had been convicted 
And I think we have that in a few examples, actually. It's at, um, just before the interviews submissions at page 161. There was a letter supporting the claimant and his family seeking to move out of the fire. judge turned at paragraph 59 <coughs> to alternative measures and said that although there was no express consideration of protective measures short of detention, it is difficult to see how it would have been possible to devise and implement such measures in the very short overnight period between Sergeant Smith's decision to refuse bail and the claimant's appearance at Becky Youth Court on the following morning. Although it is in general important that adequate reasons should be given addressing each of the limitations on the power to it is also important not to apply the limitations in a way which would make it impracticable for the police to fulfil their duties of maintaining order and protecting the public. And one asks rhetorically, what was the alternative to detaining him? Whether that detention is played out in a police station or local authority accommodation. The alternative to detaining him was not detaining him. If he was not detained, what methods were going to be devised to protect him in the period available? Well, no one has ever suggested what those methods are. It is important as well to bear in mind that the appellant himself as the judge's summary of the facts made plain, had just been charged with violent disorder and possession of a bladed article arising out of a fight. Methods of protection would therefore need to have taken into account the risk he posed to others, as well as the risk members of his attacker's gang posed to him. It would be completely artificial to uh, look at one without looking at the other. 
And it is of note that the judge did include that fact in his summary of paragraph 55. And then finally, in relation to these supposed alternatives to detention, as in the BG case, it is of note that Bexley Youth Court was not persuaded that there was any alternative short of detention. He went to Medway Secure, um, I think it was Medway, or I might get its name wrong, Medway Secure Training Centre, is that right? Or, no, Medway Secure Detention Centre. Um, I can't find it. Medway Secure Training Centre, it's at paragraph 5 of the judgment. Of page 55. Which I assume is in Medway. <laughs> <laughs> Some distance from Greenwich. Anyway. Um, those are my submissions. And the respondents' note, as I should mention, the respondents' <coughs> note is, is relevant only in that it bolsters the judge's findings that the detention was a last resort. Because in, rea in reality, having regard to the judge's findings, um, if there was any alternative to detention in a police cell, it must surely have only been detention local authority secure accommodation given that he posed a risk um, to others as well as facing a risk himself and um, the second statement which the judge admitted um, but didn't place any weight on um, to this extent merely stated a fact which, was, which did not involve any recollection of this particular case the reason why the judge didn't place weight on it and that fact being that there was no local authority secure comedy at that time. Mr. Warnock, thank you very much. Um, while you were in the judgment, um, I asked Mr. Hermer about the point that the judge mentioned at paragraph 60. Yes. Could you address that? It seems to me, and I, well, my submission is, and indeed that my. Uh, Court has seen my Leonard Judy below submitted. The two reasons are really inextricably linked. It's a question of emphasis, if you say one is the primary reason, but it simply can't, it's just artificial. Well, it, 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 I'm sorry, it's the last sentence, paragraph 60. We've already got your submissions on the first part. Well, in my submission, it's not actually that difficult a question. <laughs> Because if there is an alternative ground, lawful ground, it's conceded to be a lawful ground to detain the claimant, and that's because he also poses a risk to others, as, the, 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 as was recorded on the custom, then um, why on earth should his detention be held unlawful? It's, it's completely circular. He, 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 it, it, it's a, um, it, it, it requires one to engage in intellectual leaps to shut out of one's mind the fact that he was um, validly detained on a novel ground. Of course, it doesn't affect the compatibility argument. If I'm wrong in all the submissions I've made, the act would be incompatible insofar as it relies on protection of detention. Um, but it does affect whether or not. Um, the claimant was deprived of his liberty <coughs> unlawfully because how can he have been deprived of his liberty unlawfully even if own, detention, own protection detention was unlawful if in fact he would have been detained anyway because of the fact that he posed a risk to others and it is important again to remember in this context that Sergeant Smith's evidence was not challenged he was not cross-examined to challenge his belief that that ground for detention also existed. Does that answer my lady's question? Yes, thank you. Can I just raise one matter, Mr. Warnock? I asked you yesterday about your submission 
that um, the initial arrest was the start of the, the detention. You, you mentioned, I think, in your written submissions, uh, the Tellier in France and Tomassi in France, and you've mentioned a, a further case today. W was there anything else you wanted to bring to our attention on that, or, or do those three cases between them cover it all? Ah. I think <coughs> those three cases cover it all. Um, but that said, can I, if I think of something, can I <laughs> come back to you on it? But I think uh, um, it seems to, uh, in my submission, um, the position is very well explained in the Denmark case, yeah. considering the Bogum <coughs> in the United Kingdom of judgment. All right, thank you very much. Um, I should also, it's, it's also in Bijadi, where they, in that, I think it's paragraph 87 or 88, the court says the period of detention begins with the arrest. Yes, I think you brought that to our attention yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes. And my lady, I'm going to finish well within um, the time. Um, can this I... This is an encouraging start. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd start there. Um, can I deal with paragraph 60 and a couple of other points raised by the court before turning to the heart of my lady friend's um, <coughs> submissions? As I'd understood the question from my lady yesterday, and certainly as supplemented by my lord, Lord Justice Holroyd, one of the questions about paragraph 60 was, <coughs> did it reflect a concession by the claimant that the detention was in fact lawful, irrespective of the arguments uh, 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 about own protection. And the court may recall that um, my submission was it didn't reflect. We would go back and check the note to make sure mm. that that was accurate. We've done that. It doesn't reflect it. If you want reassurance, you can see how we put it in our skeleton argument before the court, because we do we do raise this point. It's in the supplemental bundle. And if you just say kind as to turn to paragraph 41, which is uh, at uh, page 18. This is under the, the heading of compensation. And it addresses the question at page 19, paragraph 41.4, as to whether or not there's a lumber point here. So whether or not if we succeeded on demonstrating there was no lawful basis to detain for own protection, whether or not it would only be nominal damages, or whether or not nevertheless we would show that the detention was unlawful. And um, you will see, not least in the last paragraph on that page, our case, that um, it's the, the fact that there is a primary reason, defined by the defendant as a primary reason, puts them in real difficulty. Because it would be for the detainor to demonstrate that the secondary reasons, secondary by their own def implied by their own definition, had causal potency. And we say, in this case, they, they failed to discharge that. Check the note below, both that of my junior and my instructing solicitor, and submissions were made orally to the linen judge uh, along those lines. So I hope that so, 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 so no concession, save that of course it was acknowledged that there is a power to detain to protect others. Could I also deal with the other question raised by my lady president yesterday as to whether the arguments in ground three are reflected in the pleadings. My lady, they're not in any detailed way, save that there's an assertion that, uh, it, 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 under the second ground of relief thought, that the detention was not in compliance with Article 5. And of course, it's then, as it is in common law, for the defendant to justify the detention. It's not for the claimant to prove it. The issue arose, though, and it is relevant just to set out very briefly how it arose. Um, this wasn't an issue on the pleadings before the parties. It wasn't an issue really articulated in any of the arguments in writing before the hearing commenced. Uh, 6.30 of the morning of the hearing, um, the parties received an email from the clerk to Mr Justice Chamberlain alerting the parties to the authorities of uh, IA and also um, the Law Commission paper. We responded 
just before the hearing in writing, and that's our supplemental skeleton in the bundle, where we then develop, and just for your notes, see paragraph 8, page 24, the arguments about exceptionality. In the alternative, having had IA and France flagged up, and those arguments are then developed orally by both parties in submissions before the judge, and obviously uh, are formed without objection, ground three of this appeal. That's, that's extremely helpful, Mr. Um, thank you very much. Can I turn then to the substance of our friend's submission? Yes. And, and let me, I hope, fairly encapsulate <coughs> where we now are with the respondent's position. It appears that my learned friend accepts that the plain and ordinary meaning of effected for the purpose <coughs> of securing attendance before a court precludes at least initial arrest and or initial detention on the basis of own protection. That was his answer. It was, my lady, yes. He develops two strands of argument to explain why they do not apply to a detention under the Act for Own Protection here, when made by the custody sergeant or the custody officer. The first strand of argument is that this is a continuation of detention, not an authorization of detention. And that that brings into play directly Article 5.3. And therefore, we can import from 5.3 the principle identified in IA in France, referred to in Bizzardi, that uh, 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 um, one can detain for own protection. That's, that's route one. Route two is the notion of flexibility identified in the second limb authorities, which my learned friend says can be applied by analogy to the first limb. He says, indeed, he says it's a fortiori in respect of the first limb, not simply to give a reading, a flexible reading as to what for the purpose means, but essentially, on my learned friend's analysis, to ignore it completely. There's that, there's that much flexibility, he says. So, sorry, ignore what? Ignore the... Purpose. The test, the purpose test. Right. Because my learned friend advances an argument consistent with the example posited by his lordship below at paragraph 43, that um, a detention can be properly affected, even when somebody would otherwise be given their liberty, for the sole reason that it's for their own protection. <clears throat> so it must mean, on my little friend's analysis, that there is sufficient flexibility within Article 5 that when you're in the first limb, you can authorize a detention when it is not affected for the purpose securing someone's attendance before the court. And someone's going to attend in any event. So in that S and Denmark and the rest of it. That's that well, we would say S and Denmark doesn't actually go that far, even that far on the second limb. But my my, my learned friend says when it's for a criminal offence, there's sufficient flexibility that it doesn't matter if it's effective for the purpose of securing attendance before the court. Can I examine both those propositions? So firstly, the 5-3 argument. This is an entirely new argument developed on my learned friend's feet. It wasn't argued below, not set out in the skeleton argument, entirely unheralded. If you pull up my learned friend's um, skeleton, uh, 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 
uh, and you will find the relevant passage at page 43. The sole reference to Article 5.3 is this, at Roman numeral 2. I am France Bizzardi offer some limited support for the proposition that own protection can be Article 5 compliant where the detention is short and where Article 5.3 provides a safeguard on the length of detention in any event. It, it is now described, well, it's now the primary way my learned friend develops his argument, and IA and France and Bizzardi are described as being on all fours of this case. Now, I can deal with it. I'm not making objection to it. But I can deal with it because it's utterly misconceived and it fundamentally misunderstands the relationship between Article 5.1c and Article 5.3. First, and indeed, pace. Because this is not a continuation, this is not an authorization of continued detention. If we could just pull up section 38 and, and, and just look at the plain language of the Act, it's divided to page 5 of the authorities. Thirty-eight one makes plain that the default position <coughs> is liberty. Yes, I was just looking at the wording of 31, actually. The, um, where a person arrested for an offence otherwise and under a warrant and also bail is charged with an offence, the custody of officer shall order his release from police detention. In other words, the person is already in detention. That's the yes. point, and the the um, custody officer has to make a decision about. So the argument would go whether to continue detention or not. Well, it's not. It, it, it's they are. The presumption is they are going to be let out. That's the that's the that's the underlying presumption. Then that's the active word there is unless. Well, it's it, it's order release unless is the active phrase. So the presumption is the individual is going to be released and the custody officer is only empowered to authorise detention, the authorisation of detention in the specified circumstances. So this is not a review of detention, this is not a continuing detention review. As I'm going to come on and show you in a moment, that's just simply not how it's envisaged anyway under the scheme when one talks about what a continuation, authorisation of continuation of detention means. So it's, it's, it's not a continuation detention case. And, and it can't be 5-3, because as my learner friend accepts, and I'm afraid it's fatal to his argument, the custody officer is not a judicial officer within the meaning of Article 5-3. Right, if I may, I'm going to take you to an authority that's not in the bundle, but. I provided it to my learned friend. I wouldn't normally refer to a new authority in reply, well, but this is a new point. He's, he's referred to it already. Yes, thank you. Could I, could I, hand, it, could I hand it? It's the decision of the fourth section in a case called McGee against the United Kingdom. Whilst you're handing that up, um, uh, just for information, it, 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 as far as you're concerned, the learned judge below wasn't proceeding on the basis this was a, based on an initial detention upon arrest. No. And there was no debate about that possibility. No, it wasn't put in the way that my learned friend has put it, that this is uh, a, a continuation that essentially the custody officer is uh, akin to a judicial officer under Article 5.3, and that's the way in. Now, McGee is helpful for two reasons. One, because it gives us a, a, a sense of who it who a judicial officer is within the meaning of Article 5.3, but it also deals with another point raised by my learned friend, which is the nature of the detention and the stages of detention and where art what Article 5.3 has to say uh, about the first production before the judge and subsequent reviews and how it divides those out. And that, that, that's, that's a, a helpful distinction in light of the submissions made 
by my learned friend. So, um, can I take you first, if I may, to the definition of a judicial officer? And you will find that, forgive me, at paragraph 80, page 19 of the report. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, five uh, one forms a whole with five three. Competent legal authority in paragraph one C is a synonym of abbreviated form for a judge or other officer authorized by law to exercise judicial power in paragraph three. The judicial officer must offer the requisite guarantees of independence from the executive and the parties. <coughs> Includes his or her subsequent investigate intervention in criminal proceedings on behalf of the prosecuting authority, uh, and, and then it goes on. It's reference to the kind of the core case of of, of Shiza, uh, uh, um, and um, as my learned friend accepts, that's not a custody uh, officer; it's the judge in, in under the English system to whom what is produced. In respect of the um, distinction between different parts of detention, both pre-trial um, and um, remand. Can I um, take you, please, to paragraph, uh, start with paragraph. I'm so sorry, I've got my paragraph numbers wrong. Would you just give me one moment so I make sure I take you to the right bit. Could I, could I start, I'm so sorry, if I could start um, with paragraph 73 under general principles. <coughs> Paragraph 73 starts with the usual, the usual recitation of the importance of uh, Article 5. Paragraph 74 turns the paragraph to Article 5.3. Court notes the importance of the guarantees afforded by 5.3 to an arrested person. The purpose of this provision is to ensure that the arrested persons are physically brought before a judicial officer promptly. Such automatic expedited judicial scrutiny provides <coughs> an important measure of protection against arbitrary behaviour, etc. And then this, 5.3 is part of this framework of guarantees, is structurally concerned with two separate matters. The early stages following an arrest, when an individual is taken into the power of the authorities, and the period pending any trial before a criminal court, during which the individual may be detained or released with or without conditions. These two limbs confer distinct rights and are not on their face logically or temporarily linked See, and then there's the reference to amongst uh, uh, to McKay and uh, Medvedev. This is obviously a first. This, this appeal obviously concerns the first Lim case, and that's important when we come on to what potential relevance IA and France Bizarre might have, because they are second Lim cases. So, in respect of the first Lim, the court deals with it at paragraph 76. As the court case law establishes, there must be protection through judicial control of an individual arrested or detained on a reasonable suspicion having committed offence, that's to say even before the criminal charge may have been brought, see Brogan, such control serves to provide effective safeguard against the risk of ill treatment, etc. So are we definitely first stage? My, my lady, yes, because we're before the period in which the individual is first produced for, to the court. Right. I'm going to... And... What the court then does is identify the principles that are relevant in 5.3, what 5.3 demands in respect of that first period. So we see, for example, at paragraph 77, the requirement of promptness. So they, they come before the court quickly. One of the issues in Brogan that really set the 96-hour absolute limit. So can we just go back to 76? Yes, my lady. You just read the whole of seven. Of course, my lady. Yes. So I, I think I taken you. Have I taken you to bro to the reference to Brogan? Yes. Such um, yeah. such control serves to provide effective safeguards against the risk of ill treatment, which it is in its greatest in the initial stage of perhaps continuing deprivation of liberty following the bringing of a criminal charge, and against the abuse of powers bestowed on law enforcement officers or other authorities for what should be a narrowly restricted purposes. 
and exercisable strictly in accordance with the prescribed uh, procedures. The judicial control must satisfy the requirements set out below. Mm. Well, that suggests that what you're saying that it covers the period following the bringing of a criminal charge before getting to court. Yes. So it, it's, it's not just pre-charge. No, no, it's it, not. It, it covers post-charge up to getting to court. Yeah. The first, the first period, the importance is um, this needs to be independently reviewed. And, and we can see that if we go to the, then the subheading, so paragraph 77, promptness, um, paragraph 79, it's automatic, you don't have to ask to be produced to the judge. Uh, uh, subparagraph 3, we've looked at, those are the characteristics. Um, and then we can see at paragraph 4, uh, the presumption is in favour of, I beg your pardon, subparagraph 4, paragraph 86. Um, we then turn to the second limb. Um, so the presumption is in favour of release. We're now under pre-trial or remand period, as established in Newmeister. The second limb of Article 5.3 does not give judicial authorities a choice between either bringing an accused to trial within a reasonable time or granting him or her provisional release pending trial until, until conviction. He or she must be presumed innocent. And the purpose of the provision under consideration is essentially to require his or her provisional release once his or her continued detention ceases to be reasonable. Continued detention, therefore, can be justified in a given case only if there are specific indications of a genuine requirement <coughs> of public interest, which, notwithstanding the presumption of innocence, outweighs the rule of respect for the individual liberty laid down in Article 5. The persistence of a reasonable suspicion that the person arrested has committed an offence is a condition sine qua non for the lawfulness of the continued just detention. But with a lapse of time, this will no longer be enough to justify continued detention. The court has not attempted to translate this concept into a fixed number of days, weeks, months, or years, or into various periods, depending on the seriousness of the offence. Once the existence of a reasonable suspicion is no longer enough, the court must establish whether the other grounds given by the judicial authorities continue to justify the deprivation of liberty. In particular, they must determine whether such grounds were relevant and sufficient and whether the uh, national authorities displayed a special diligence in the conduct of the proceedings. And so this is the context in which one needs to see the assessment of the reasonableness <coughs> of time in cases such as IA or in IA. So it's not just enough once you're in the second limb to have a reasonable suspicion. There's going to come a point in which you're going to have to show something more because of Article 5.3 in the second limb. So it's another reason why IA and Bizarre don't assist my learned friend. We're not, dealing, we're not dealing with the same period of detention. You can't transpose the principles that the court has developed in respect of that second limb for understandable reasons where you have detention for two, three, four, five years before trial, in which something more than saying we're tending to prosecute on a reasonable suspicion may be thought necessary. You can't transport that readily understandable line of authority into the position that we're facing here in the first limb. What you've got to do, what 5.3 tells you in the first limb is get them before the judge quickly within a reasonable time. So e every step of the way, uh, I'm so sorry, my lady. Paragraph 19. It says, in order to ensure the right guaranteed is practical and effective, not theoretical and illusory, it's not only good practice, but highly desirable. In order to minimize the delay for the judicial officer, We've heard your submission for what that means. Who conducts the first automatic review of lawfulness and the existence of a ground for detention also has the competence to consider release on bail. Yes. That's the position of the custody sergeant, isn't no, it? No, no, because the, uh, as my learned friend, it's not just my submission, my lady, it's conceded by the defendant that we would say it would be an unprecedented and we would say constitutionally trub uh, 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 um, but the, the complex. But the fact is that the custody, but we've got, we looked at the Beijing rules, yes. and we looked at the fact that Section 38 gives the custody officer the chance, the, the, the duty, to consider after arrest, yes. charge, whether somebody should be released on bail. Yes, certainly. But that, 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 that the fact that the custody sergeant has that um, power doesn't uh, 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 um, mean that they then become a judicial officer. Just because a nature of a, of a custody officer's power might 
converge in one respect with that which the, which the judge has when she or he is considering the hearing on five uh, pursuant to five three means that somehow the custody sergeant is therefore transformed into a judge simply because you have those powers. <clears throat> so, for, for, for those reasons and those I, I, I advanced in my uh, opening submissions, 5.3 doesn't permit detention for own protection under Section 38. Doesn't, doesn't provide an answer. And that's why IA and France and Bizzardi are dealing with different points uh, 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 rather than ultimately, uh, as my learned friend would have to say, in order for him to get anywhere, that they are identifying general <coughs> principles relevant to grounds in, for detention under 5.1c that do not exist in A to F, which is a, re, which would be a revolutionary solution. Could you just tell that, just want to make sure I've understood your, um, just in a nutshell, could you repeat why you say um, this is, that the decision under Section 38 post-charge was not a decision on competent authority, on continued detention? Why it's not continued detention? Uh, well, well, why it's not a situation of, con of considering whether to continue detention. It's, <coughs> it's a fresh decision. It's yes. an initial decision but, that falls within Article 5.1c. Well, I, the, the, the governing test is not whether it's initial or not. The governing test is, is this the decision of uh, a, a, an individual to deprive another individual of their liberty? Or in the Article 5 context, of, a, of, of an officer of the state to deprive an individual of their liberty? Initial isn't, isn't a governing test. And then, so what one turns to is then, well, what is the nature of the decision being made by the custody officer? And for that, we look at the plain language of Section 38.1. That this is somebody who, who has a right to be at liberty unless the custody officer says, no, I'm going to deprive you of your liberty for the reason set out. That's the clear, we would say, the clear meaning of Section 38.1. Well, surely it means he has a right to be released from detention unless dot, dot, dot. If the custody officer was half an hour late, the accused is he's in detention for that half hour. Detention hasn't ended. And there's a presumption in his favour. But I'm speaking for myself, I'm struggling at the moment to understand how it can be said that the person locked in a cell in the police station waiting for the custody officer to get to his case and uh, allow the charging and uh, review procedure to start, he isn't then in detention so that the, the question becomes one of continuing that detention or, or bringing that detention to an end. Well, I, my, my, my Lord, I think the way we would answer that is to say you, you, you examine the question as to what the status is at the point at which the, the person appears before the custody uh, officer. Yes. When the person before, appears before the custody officer, the starting point is they are entitled to their liberty. That's, no, that's, they're, they're entitled to be released, as you say. His status when he's brought before the custody officer is he's a prisoner. Uh, well, my lord, he's I think. Detainee. My lord, forgive me if I'm missing the point, but for, uh, but for the purpose of Article Five, there's no meaningful distinction we would submit between someone being entitled to release and entitled to their liberty, from an Article 5 perspective, they're, they're, they're the same thing. No, I, I, I agree that the distinction I'm drawing between what I said and what you said <laughs> is that the entitlement, um, as it seems to me at present, is to be released from existing detention. Well, the question from an Article... I, my Lord, of course, I see, I, I see that. Yep. My, Lord, my submission is that from an Article 5 perspective, that's not the question. The question is, is the effect of my decision to deprive someone of the liberty that they would otherwise have? And the answer undoubtedly is here, is, is yes here. Look at the statutory scheme. But, 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 but it, even if I were wrong on that, 
This is still is not still not in the five three territory for the reasons that, 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 that I've explained by reference to he's not the, the custody officer is not a judicial officer within the meaning of five three that's accepted, and we and, and beyond that, we're in the first limb of uh, the period under five three, and um, matters uh, grounds such as own protection don't come into play at that stage. They come into play later. So the custody, so the logic of your argument is that uh, assume for the sake of on the facts that the custody officer considered this person's at risk, real risk of harm. This was not a factor he could take into account in deciding whether to release him from detention would be a factor that would be relevant when? At what stage would it become relevant? Well, as, as, as Strasbourg, as the fourth section was setting out, there, there, there's, no, there's no clear line at a point in which a detention has marked a certain number of weeks or days at which the mere fact that someone is suspected of a criminal offence and is being detained to be brought to, to trial, that the mere fact of that is enough. There comes a point, depending on severity and depending on length, in which the court examines, in addition to whether or not there are reasonable grounds for commission of an offence for which a person is being brought to trial, the length of detention is just far too long. And it's at that stage, well within a second limb stage, in which you can start looking at factors such but, as but, own protection. Standing back, standing back a minute, um, if somebody is at risk, real risk of harm, what you're saying is irrelevant for the purposes of the decision that's made under Section 38. If that is the sole reason why somebody's being detained, it is legally it, irrelevant. Well, I think that that is, we, we are in the position somebody's been charged. If that's the sole reason, I don't think there's any dispute about that. No. But you're saying it's it's not a factor which can be considered oh. at that stage. It can't be the reason for detention. When it comes before the youth court, the youth court would simply be looking at the exceptions within the Bail Act. Yes. And, and own protection doesn't come, doesn't arise there. Uh, th well, own protection can arise, and we've, we've put some written submissions in, uh, uh, in on that. So I can give my, my lady the, re the reference for it. Uh, ultimately, we say uh, you cannot detain, lawfully detain, anybody for the sole reason of their own protection in criminal proceedings, where you can't show that, that that's the reason for which the detention was affected, the purpose for which they were affected, it's affected. Uh, it's unlikely to, to arise in most scenarios in a bail application, but there may be, there may be, there may be pinch points. Uh, and we, 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 we've, we've dealt with that in writing. And I'm, I'm going to develop in a moment. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. It's, it's, it's page 28 of the supplemental submit, uh, submissions uh, 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 onwards. I, I am going to deal, though, my lady, if I may, with the suggestion that this is somehow a binary choice between detaining a child overnight in a police cell and release back onto the streets face whatever risks there are. <coughs> and, uh, but I'll deal with that in a moment. So that's, those are my submissions in response on Article 5.3 and why Article 5.3 doesn't provide an answer to this case. Are you going to deal with Thomas Hill and the references relied upon by Mr. Warnock in relation to the relevant period going back to the arrest? Well, uh, my lady... Have you done that already? The, the, well, no, Monday, I, I think the sh our short answer on that is Article 5.1c is not a one-hit wonder. It doesn't the very first time someone is arrested and then is irrelevant when people are subsequently, custody officers, are subsequently deciding whether to uh, 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 let's, let someone out, as the presumption of the statute is that they shall, or detain them. applies there every bit as much as it does to an arresting officer. It's not, it's not, it's not, you get one shot at it and then everything else is in 5 3. 
51C binds that, binds that custody officer when exercising her or his powers under Section 38. But um, can you help me with this, Mr. Herman, in, in the light of um, Mr. Warnock's submission this morning? What, what, what is the position then when the police want to arrest somebody who can't sensibly be regarded as a flight risk, an eminently, eminently respectable person, strongly tied to the local area? No reason at all to doubt that should he be charged, um, he will be <coughs> he will attend where and when this is required. Um, and he's being arrested in order to be questioned about a suspected offence. But that's, by definition, that's all it is at that stage. So, on, on, on your submissions, what's the lawful justification for taking him into custody? My Lord, if, if I'm so sorry, if it's considered necessary for his own protection. No, no, no just, just generally. Well, my Lord, the presumption will be that he's not going to be taken into custody, but if, however, it's felt necessary, if custody is felt necessary in order to secure his attendance at court, then that will be perfectly lawful. No, no, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting back a stage. Yes. When, when he's first arrested and taken yes. to the police station and put into a cell to await the start of an interview, how, how does that fit in with your approach about oh, I'm so uh, sorry. having the, the purpose of effecting his uh, production uh, before uh, a court? Uh, because, uh, because that's been held in a, ser in, in, a, in a serious case, I think alluded to by my learned friend Mr Warnock, as compatible, but not in a way that, that really throws light on this question of purpose. Um, but it's it's for purpose of continuing an investigation that may lead to court. Um, that's the purpose for which it is affected. I'm so sorry. It, I, I because we don't have the cases before my lord. It's um, it's unsatisfactory. But if the court would be assisted by no, no, distinguishing no, those cases, I just wondered if you were disagreeing with with Mr. Warnock about those cases. But that, that's fine. Thank you very much. Unless the court has any further questions on Article 5.3, I was then going to turn to the, sort of the separate limb of flexibility that my learned friend um, contends for. And um, it's not really explained by my learned friend or developed other than by reference, which he took you to yesterday, of to paragraphs 123 to, a, and to 124 of the Denmark case, and today by reference to two passages to the House of Lords in Austin. Can I make a number of points about that? All, all those cases, as my learned friend acknowledges, are addressed to the second limb. And Denmark falls within a long line of cases, all addressed to the second limb. So preventative detention. Preventative detention. And as one would see, not least from Denmark, they are clear that these are cases about the second limb. See the heading under which paragraph 123 falls. It's second limb. There is no suggestion in any of the cases that the principles developed are of wider application. Second point is in within those cases, within the second limb cases, leading up to Denmark, it was taken as given that the purpose requirement in Article 5.1c means what it says. Mainly it means that the purpose of detention was to secure attendance at court, in that case under preventative powers. That's why Lord Panic counsel for the uh, respondent in this case in Austin conceded that if the kettling in Oxford Circus was in fact a deprivation of liberty, he'd be required to show that Lawless was wrong in order to justify it under 5.1c. The same presumption applied in Hicks. That's why the Supreme Court read in that the purpose to secure attendance does not actually have to eventuate in order for legality under 5.1c to be made out. These cases actually serve to underline the importance of the purpose test. But what my learned friend seeks to do here isn't as per Hicks or Denmark 
to read in some flexibility to the purpose test, whereby legality is not vitiated because it doesn't eventuate in a court hearing, irrespective of the initial purpose. My learned friend's argument is purpose doesn't matter at all. So he t not only seeks to apply the second limb with no, where there's been a no authority to support it applying to the first limb, he seeks to go far further than those cases. Next point is that there has been, as I developed, a clear rationale set out over case by case. I took you through the history, starting from lawless, about the policy concerns, the particular policy concerns vis-a-vis -vis preventative detention. So in a whole series of cases, the Strasbourg Court and the domestic courts have faced a very real problem. Football hooligans or neo-Nazis running down the streets, they haven't yet committed a crime, or they haven't at the time of the police operation at stars, but what do you do? What can you do? And that's why Germany, in, in, in Ostendorf, one can see the submissions of the German government. They're pulling out their hair. This is, what, this is how we control it on our streets. We have no other means of doing it. The same policy concerns you see from Austin onwards. It's a binary position. And the court, in those circumstances, having regard to the need to maintain public order, in those circumstances, permitted some degree of flexibility, eventually. The position here could not be more different. As the interveners have explained, there are a number of different means by which children can be protected other than having to effectively water down a fundamental human right protected in Article 5 and detain children overnight in a police cell. And part of that is, go to the local authority. That's, there's a framework. There's a statutory child-centric framework for dealing with this. We are not in the position that Germany was before the court, or Denmark was before the court, which is we have no other alternative. You don't allow this, there's going to be disaster on our streets. That is not the position here. My final point under this heading is you, 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 what you can't do, which was hinted at by my learned friend, is, is say, well, Article 2 and 3 impose positive obligations on the police. And you've got to read Article 5 in a way that works for that. I mean, A, that's wrong as a matter of principle. These are all unqualified rights within the same scheme. B, it's not, it's not said that these powers are only exercised when you meet an Osmond Article 2 type threshold. And C, there are other ways of the state complying with its obligations under Article 2 and 3 other than detention of a child in a police cell overnight. That repeats the submissions I made a moment ago. So there is no room for the flexible approach advanced by my learned friend. Could I just deal finally with, with one final point raised by my learned friend, which is um, that the child is going to be detained in any event. Because under the Act, they're still under a detention power, even when they're sent to the local authority. But the, the simple point to that is that does not equate the fact that they might be still detained for the purposes of Section 38 does not mean it's a deprivation of liberty for the purposes of Article 5. That's the simple answer to that. So Article 5 gets concerned, whereas a deprivation of liberty, C, for example, Austin. Sorry, it's completely my fault. I haven't followed that. Can you just say it again? Yes, my lady. My, my learned friend's submission is that um, when one looks at the alternatives to detention advanced by the appellant, what should have been considered, there's still detention. 
because my learned friend says it's still a, it's still the police is the police is still detaining, albeit the individual is going to be accommodated other than in the police station. Well, that, 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 that is right. But it is not. Just simply because there, it is a power to detain does not mean that the child is going to be deprived of their liberty within the meaning of Article 5. So that is defined by reference to the facts on the ground. So if you're sent to a your local authority accommodation, it's most unlikely you're going to be in a cell. It's not going to be a deprivation of liberty. It's not going to be incapacitated. That, that's already under my third, un, under ground three, because it presupposes that this is compatible in the first place. And um, my, my, my last submission is directed to um, Article 3. My learned friend says that the custody record can't be read like a statute. But it must be read in accordance with the requirements of the statute, section 38, as read compatibly with Article 5, which means that the defendant, whether through the custody record or otherwise, must be able to convincingly demonstrate two things. Firstly, that this was a, 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 a detention authorised because of exceptional reasons. And they must convincingly demonstrate that the alternatives to detention were made out. And the submissions I advanced to my ladies and my lord yesterday as to what those range of alternatives would look like, not least the local authority or the aunt, those are uh, 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 um, all submissions that were advanced equally before the learned judge. And we, we say that if the mere facts as recorded on the custody record suffice to demonstrate that uh, it has been convincingly demonstrated that the detention overnight of a child was exceptional, exceptional circumstances, and convincingly demonstrated that the alternatives were properly explored, then the reality is if, that is, if that is sanctioned, then the threshold for exceptionality is set low. And for all the reasons set, set out by the interveners, that would not simply be difficult to square with what Article 5 requires, but difficult to sit easily within the broader international framework with which, with, with, within which, of course, Article 5 must be interpreted. My lady, unless there are other matters on which I can assist the court, those are the submissions in reply. Thank you so much. We'll just rise for a moment.
everybody for their very helpful submissions in this case and for all those who sit behind those who've made the submissions for all the work uh, that has gone into making this a very smooth running and interesting hearing uh, for, uh, for us. Uh, we're very grateful to all of you. Uh, we will not give our decision today. Uh, a draft uh, of our judgment or judgments uh, will be circulated uh, to the parties in the normal way. Uh, and I would include for this purpose the intervener um, for the correction of any obvious uh, errors or omissions of a typographical nature, but obviously not for purposes of re arguing. Uh, there will be no need uh, for the parties to attend at the handing down. And we would invite them to agree, if possible, uh, the terms of any order um, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, is required, apart from the obvious ones, in advance of the handing down to the court's approval. If we do require any further information or submissions, uh, then the parties will be invited to make them in writing in the first instance. Uh, I think that completes uh, today. Uh, you were indeed, Mr. Hammer, as you said, uh, able to finish in good time. And we give you our thanks once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.